Hi everyone, and welcome again to my audiovisual channel. My name is Gabriella Handel, and I'm a draftsman and also the host of this show, A Conversation About Art. During each episode, I look for the meaning of art and beauty through conversations with colleagues in different artistic fields. Today, I offer you episode 67, and I will talk with artist Alana Benham. If you'd like to support this podcast, you can do so by liking and sharing this video and also subscribing to my audiovisual channel. These are all immediate and at no additional cost to you. If you'd like to show your support with money, it's also very welcome and appreciated. You can do so by purchasing my drawings directly from my website, which is gabriellahandle.com. You can purchase crafts I make from eBay, by prints of my drawings, or leaving me a tip. Thank you for your time and attention in watching this episode and do leave a comment so I know you saw it. I hope you enjoy it. Thank you very much. <clears throat> okay. Alana Benham, thank you very much for agreeing to talk to me today. Welcome to my podcast, A Conversation About Art. You are episode 67. Why don't you tell our future listeners and viewers who you are and what you do? Certainly. I'm Alana Benham. Uh, I'm a visual artist living outside of Montreal, Quebec. Uh, my husband, Eric Manella, and I run Atelier de Brissol together in Montreal. Uh, it's been 20 years now since we began with that. And that feels like a big accomplishment, 20 years of teaching and sustaining your own school, uh, two artists you know, finding a way to, to exist in the world together. So we're very proud of that. We teach a program of drawing and painting and anatomy. Uh, we met when we were students at the New York Academy mm. and I decided to come to Montreal and make a life there. And we're very pleased that uh, things have gone well for us. Okay, okay. Um, so, but wait, so you're, you're from Canada though, right? I'm not, I'm from the US, I grew up there, uh, but I've been in Canada for 20 years now. So this is definitely home. Okay, okay, that makes sense. Um, okay, so how would you say, you know, how, when did you start making, I mean, I wanna, I wanna use the word art, but maybe, you know, if you started when you making things when you were a little kid, you didn't like think of it that way, kind of, sort of. So exactly. when did, when, when in that case, would you say you started making things, creative things, I suppose would be the term. And then <laughs> how did you arrive to making art? That's a great question. Uh, I had the natural inclination to draw like a lot of young kids do. Um, my parents found very early on that I was easily amused with the stack of paper and some crayons. And uh, some of my early memories were, as a young kid, uh, my father's a mathematician, he was teaching calculus. My mom was in nursing school and there were some times when in the evening I had to go along to my dad's calculus class and sit in the back row with a big stack of paper and a 64 box of Crayola crayons. And I would sit there through the whole thing, happy, quiet, and drawing at age Perfectly three. Perfectly entertained. Yeah, so from there, um, you know, progressively, as you grow, you start to have more ideas and more uh, of a standard for yourself, perhaps. Um, so I just sort of navigated my way through, was lucky to find good art teachers at uh, sort of pivotal points in time in high school. And then again, after that, started taking some life drawing classes uh, when I was in high school at SUNY Purchase and just really um, got inspired and motivated at that point and started to visit museums. At that time, I was living outside of New York City and would go into the Met and just connect with with the history and the works that I saw there. And it was very inspiring, you know, to be a teenager and sort of encountering these things for the first time and uh, having that shape your understanding of the world uh, was powerful. And that has stayed with me since. So from there, I uh, went to Brown University, started in pre-med, actually. I, mm. I was pretty sure I wanted to major in biology and biochemistry. But after a couple of years with that, I found myself just firmly in the middle of the pack and not feeling inspired, not loving it. Um, so um, what does in the middle fun. of the pack mean? Just, I, I wasn't doing well. I wasn't succeeding. And I looked down the line at what kind of future I could expect 
uh, if I followed through in biology, biochemistry, and I just saw myself working in somebody else's lab, you know, working for somebody else. I didn't have the capacity to sort of lead a research team. I knew that at the time, mm -hmm. you know, and I just didn't like what I imagined down the line for myself. So my parents encouraged me to take a little time off. Uh, I worked in floral design and served drinks in a bar for a period of time and then gathered myself to go back to Brown and finish a concentration in museum studies, an independent mm -hmm. concentration that pulled together anthropology, art history, uh, with an eye towards considering how ob objects are presented in a museum context. Um, which was wonderful. I had an amazing mentor at Brown at that time, Martha Joukowsky, uh, who is an archaeologist who dug at Petra for most of her career. And she was just such a giving and, and wonderful person. And I was lucky to cross paths with her as well. Um, while I was there, I cataloged a collection of Persian and Indian uh, miniature paintings for the Special Collections Library at Brown, which was very, very interesting work. And then after that, I uh, worked a little bit in the world and then decided maybe it was time to, you know, see what was inside myself. Maybe thinking about doing a master's in fine art would be kind of the next step for myself. I was considering going down the road of art conservation at that time. Um, I would have needed reading knowledge of German to get into programs and that, which I didn't have. Mm -hmm. So I thought, well, you know, conservation is a discipline for highly skilled and intelligent people. Uh, it's very competitive and uh, also it's a discipline for non artists, meaning that you can't, you know, have any illusion of putting something of yourself into the work you're, you're doing an important job, but you should you should be invisible and reversible within that context. So, uh, so I thought, you know, maybe before that I should see what's inside and, and see, um, see what's there mm -hmm. in terms of my own abilities and uh, my own ideas. So I got into the New York Academy and was very excited to spend two years there. The faculty was so inspiring at that time, mm -hmm. it was 2000 to 2002. And just what what an amazing environment what what a special place to be um so i was very interested in uh, anatomy artistic anatomy from that point this was the first time i had encountered this and i felt like it helped me overcome so many of my own limitations and problems mm -hmm. and that i felt in my own work related to drawing the figure um, so i pursued oil painting drawing and artistic anatomy there and then eventually uh met the man who who would become my husband eric and Manila. you were classmates yeah we were classmates there nice. yeah yeah and uh, uh of like the same year yeah the same cool. year yeah he was working as the model coordinator for some of that time so we had close relationships with the faculty and would sometimes go and draw with them in their own studios uh just independently at night which was wonderful nice. um, and uh, yeah, then we stayed in New York another year or so beyond that, and then moved up to Montreal and mm -hmm. uh, started our own labs there. Okay. Um, I'd like to know more about the transition. Uh, no, not, well, maybe the transition, but just what happened in between being in the middle of, I mean, not being in the middle, I mean, like deciding to study museum and conser museum stuff and conservation to getting to the point of wanting to make art again because like by the time that you decided that you maybe you wanted to start making art again or you know study fine art you know like to make work or your own work I mean what what happened I mean did you completely stop making work like the entire time like did you were you able to draw or anything while you were in med school or studying museum or conservation or this type of stuff so like what hap what happened in between that it brought you to wanting to make art uh your, your work again and why did you call it looking within or you know why, why did you call it that yeah that's a good question i i had always worked on my own i always kept a sketchbook or you know took a little time here and there to draw i also always felt 
limited my, by my own inabilities, my own technical shortcomings. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, it, it, and I, I also felt limited by a lack of consistency in my own work. So when, when you sit down to draw or to paint, you know, sometimes things start well and then they take a detour and then they, they are not going so well. Other times they start well and they continue well and it's a gratifying experience. But um, at that time, before going to the academy, I, I didn't have much of a method in mind. I had never taken any art classes that gave me a strategy for kind of working out the problems that you encounter uh, when you're trying to work representationally. Um, so I just was going on some sort of instinct which was, you know, okay, but, but I knew there was more. Um, so I was just interested to get a more thorough grounding in, in technique and also in, um, in sort of engagement and in seeing, you know, how other people solve these issues for themselves, how other people work out their compositions and progress from having an idea to realizing it. I, I just wanted to, understand more about um, what it takes to, to create the kind of work that I was hoping to make. Mm -hmm. uh, and I, I called it looking within just to see um, sort of what, what's inside you, you know, to see where you could go with your own abilities. Uh, as a young person, um, you know, it takes a lucky combination of circumstances and, and patience and hard work uh, to get to that point. And I, I was hoping I could arrive there one day. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry, to get to what point? To get to the point where you feel like like you're working in a natural or an effortless way, you know, where mm -hmm. it doesn't always feel like a struggle or when you mm -hmm. encounter a struggle, you can navigate your way through and, and, mm -hmm. uh, and lead yourself out of it when it okay. arises, because it will always arise, right? And, mm -hmm. and it's not like that's something that ends and one day you walk through a door and everything is easy. Like, mm -hmm. We all know that's not true. But, um, you know, it's nice to have a few strategies to work yourself through those, those problems when they do arise so that you can, you know, push through and, and realize something uh, that, that you can be proud of. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, that reminds me a little bit of um, a muse from the previous episode because um, I talked with Dan Bunn, who I don't, I don't think he graduated from the academy. But anyway, the thing is that um, I was talking about how I was drawing skulls for a little while there repeatedly, and mm -hmm. it was just a skull, like anterior view. Um, basically the same basically just drawing a skull over and over again because i i have a project where anyway the project doesn't matter the thing is that i was drawing several skulls and every time that i was drawing a skull even though it was the same view i was like how am i gonna do this <laughs> every each time i was like um so it just i guess it makes me think a little bit of of what you're of i mean your 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 own uh reply to my question reminded me of that and also it also makes me think of my perception, I guess, of the atelier, you know, mm -hmm. the, like the cla the traditional classical atelier, mm -hmm. um, because um, I sort of think, because I mean, okay, so it's scary when I'm like looking at a drawing and I'm going to draw uh, the fifth skull of the week or something, and I, I'm still like, how am I going to do this, yeah. you know, mm -hmm. um, because it's a little bit scary because I want the skull to look cool and stuff or whatever, and... Mm -hmm. You know, somehow, even though I've done it, I've done a, a bunch of times already, it still feels intimidating. But at the same time, there's like the, what I kind of consider the opposite of that, which is mm -hmm. like, again, it's my perception because I'm really not familiar with the method of study in a classical atelier, mm -hmm. um, where there's like the repeated for very many times uh, study of, you know, like sight size and lots of measuring and whatever it is. And I feel like, although repetition is obviously how we learn and that's obviously good and everything because you know, that's how you make your muscle memory and stuff. Mm -hmm. um, I kind of feel, it's like the perception that I have when I look at some atelier work, not all of it, mm -hmm. obviously, um, mm -hmm. where it feels like it's formulaic and it kind of, I have the perception that the person didn't enjoy making that because there wasn't anything to struggle with. 
because mm -hmm. there wasn't anything to look for because, oh, they're so familiar with it by now. They're, they don't even have to look for the socket or whatever, you know, you see what mm -hmm. I'm saying? So, so, so like, I guess for me, for example, if I'm drawing different models, it's like, mm -hmm. yeah, they all have eye sockets, but every eye socket is different. Yeah. right so it's like even if it's like the same eye socket with the same weird shape of the bone and stuff and like the same uh eye bags underneath the same like the same anatomical element elements each mm -hmm. one is different and so like it is it is up to the artist in the moment to mm -hmm. perceive that those things are different so 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 i feel like or perceive again um that it's like a trap almost in a way that, you know, classical atelier or traditional atelier people who study that end mm -hmm. up kind of drawing an eye socket and not like Alana's eye socket. You see what I'm yeah. saying? What, what do you think about that? I do. I, I think that can play in on many levels too. I think, um, you know, a little, a little knowledge can be extremely helpful. You know, once mm -hmm. you know what an eye socket looks like, uh, that gives you a tool to bring to your next observation to you to your next uh, encounter with the model um which sort of prepares you for some of the challenges there but it's true that if you then kind of rely on your own way of doing that then every drawing that you make from that point on will kind of look the same and and mm -hmm. a little too formulaic so um ideally i think for me i didn't go through a, a super rigorous atelier training, but I did do, you know, a bit of block and drawing. I learned how to measure. I never really enjoyed sight size. That's not really a, a part of the way I work, but um, I guess I work sort of with a combination of block in uh, technique and anatomical sort of cubic form construction um, when I approach the figure. And so there's a little anatomy in there. There's a little measuring. There's a little um, process of comparison uh, to make sure that you know proportions are reasonably well in hand and, and you're not sort of building in grave errors <laughs> yeah. to your drawing from the start. So I, I, for me that that's what's been most helpful sort of a combination of of seeking to understand the body um, so that I so that I have a more sensitive perception when I draw a model and I can sort of um, appreciate the individualities of that person uh, from the framework of sort of you know what an average or sort of what a basic view of the of the body is mm -hmm. yeah i i really agree with you about the about, with the comment about the rigorous mm -hmm. traditional atelier training because it is indeed rigorous and that I I also just despised side size. I tried it for three for three hours. I think about three hours or just under three hours because uh, during cast drawing, because I was a drawing major at the academy and cast drawing is mandatory for uh, drawing majors. So the teacher was like, "Hey, do you guys want to try this?" And I was like, "Yes, I do," because I wanted to tr learn, you know. And then I was just like on the verge of really <laughs> angry tears at the end. I was really really frustrated at the end there. Yeah, um, yeah. and you know I. I've I've made that a similar sort of comment about that the, the atelier, which is I think some people have called it a move uh, a movement lately because there are lots of ateliers, which is great, mm -hmm. um, and like I don't necessarily mean to kind of like shit on it or anything because I think it's great. You know I I don't I mean you probably know already, but the academy was founded by Andy Warhol among other people because um and and he founded it he wanted the school to have a solid like traditional sort of training because he felt like he lacked it yeah. um and that's really cool because it's because and, and obvious and you know obviously that's important an important part of like what the atelier movement brings because it's like um you know it, it's cool to like want to break out from the rules and stuff but you still should know the rules yeah i agree with you that I, I think in you know my husband and i play music too he's a great guitar yeah. player and so we kind of. But what you know, what kind of music stuff do you do? Sorry to. Um, I play a little bit of flute. We sing harmonies. Yes. I grew up playing okay. saxophone, which I don't play that much anymore. But you know, it's there for me whenever I'm ready to pick it up. I'm, yes. It's there. But uh, you know, in music, that traditional foundation has always been there. It's never mm -hmm. disappeared. 
you know, it's always, it's always been available for, for young people who are beginning their journey with an instrument. And you can go as far as you want to go with music theory in any direction. Uh, you know, you can access, um, you know, the way music theory has developed or been expressed in different parts of the world at different times. There's just this vast and vast understanding of it that's never disappeared somehow in visual arts things things did sort of uh, change fundamentally in the early 20th century and i think we're just now getting back to a more balanced view perhaps of the relationship between technique and artistic uh, capability and the expression of ideas um, in in the visual arts mm -hmm. uh, so um, you know i feel the like the atelier the atelier movement has contributed to that in a positive way. It's given uh, people access to skills that were difficult to find, you know, 50 years ago. Um, illustrators had them, perhaps, these, you know, drawing techniques and, and sort of uh, conventions of representation skills sort of hung out there, I think, waiting for, for uh, a time to return into sort of a more general artistic culture and now they have and uh, so now maybe we're reestablishing a link to um, traditional modes of thought or uh, avenues of learning in the visual arts which i think is welcome as long as that can also coexist with you know some sort of modern spirit on the part of the artist some sort of uh, personal um, drive to take those techniques and make them your own uh, great things can happen. Yeah, yeah. I definitely agree that it'd be nice for for some kind of balance to be achieved because for example, like for the time of the salon mm -hmm. uh, in France, I definitely I think I would agree that that was way too um I don't know, like strict mm -hmm. in the sense that they were super strict about what Okay, not 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 about the training necessarily. I mean, yes, about the training, but then after, they were really strict about what kind of stuff was considered to be good, and then what kind of stuff could get into the salons and stuff, you know. Um, and so I kind of I kind of think of, so that's too much too much order. <laughs> yeah. um, and then, when you know postmodernism and modernism and this this type of this type of type of stuff like Dadaism came around, it's like that's too much chaos. So like, yeah. I think, so that, that's like, that's like a, a Jordan Peterson type thing, you know, like order chaos. So, yeah. so like, I would really like it if there, if there could be some kind of a balance. And I think that's one of the, that's one of the things that probably drew me a lot to the Academy because it had traditional stuff. And really what I wanted most was to be taught anatomy because I, I would not be able to teach that myself, even though to myself, even yeah. though I am very drawn to it. And also the figure drawing, it's like this stuff, I very, it's like, I was not able to find anything else, you know, like as a master's degree or, you know, I don't know if I didn't search enough, but I didn't want to find anything, anything else that wasn't as rigorous as an atelier because I, I don't want that rigorousness, you know, that's too much for me. So like, I feel like the Academy, at least when I went, you know, like you think maybe when, when you went, it was like the peak or something. I, I quite enjoyed my two years, like a lot um and it was like this amazing balance indeed of uh anatomical study the figure and you know a, a, a little bit of modernity you know like some some historical study or whatever it was but it was really more you know I still have my écarche like you uh and and so it's like yeah so I I, I really agree with those thoughts there um okay so all right so um, Mrs. Benham, what is art in your opinion? This is an excellent question. Uh, in my opinion, art is a communication device that is freed from the constraints of utilitarianism. So it is open to functioning on multiple levels in the realms of symbolism and metaphor, mm -hmm. or it's able to be literal and, and, and perhaps utilitarian, but it, it has the ability to function on a wide spectrum. Um, it also 
has the ability to reach people um, more broadly, I think, than, than language or, or our sort of utilitarian day-to-day -day types of communication. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's, it's something that also um, kind of reinforces our humanity on a level. It's something, art is something that um, sort of entices us to, to read it and take some time to understand it. Uh, it sort of satisfies, satisfies our human curiosity and our need to know about things. Um, if you've, if you've ever spent time around small kids, you'll see how excited they are when they know about something, you know, they want to tell you all about it. And I, I think we never really stop being that way. We always um, are sort of seeking a little bit more. And in the arts, visual art, music, uh, theater, you are sort of enticed to engage and to find meaning for yourself in that encounter. And that's gratifying for us on a human level, I think, when you, when you, when you take the time to engage in something, your experience of it deepens and you, um, it, it becomes uh, more complete, perhaps, more, more than just, uh, you know, just a, a simple thing, you can relate to it on, on multiple levels and find your own meaning within it. Mm -hmm. um, why, do you, why do you think art isn't utilitarian? And, and what, what, does that, what, what, what does that mean, sorry? What does that mean and why do you think art isn't I, I guess by that I mean, I mean something designed to convey a specific thing to convey a specific meaning, you know, the way we, um, you know, talk about what we have to do this afternoon or the way we, you know, organize our lives and our minds about what's next, the way, we, you know, utilitarian communication, I think, involves like fairly standard and uh, objective terms. Um, but art doesn't have to be that way. It, it, it may be. It, it may have, you know, a definite meaning that is, you know, easily deduced, or it can be, it can be very abstract. Um, and I think people enjoy all types of, of uh, experiences that way. Um, I think, you know, we are, we're an inquisitive species. And when we're able to look at art from the past, from our own time, you know, questions arise within us about, you know, when it was made, why, for what purpose, and we, we start to ask questions that we may or may not be able to find answers for. But the process of, of questioning, I think, is satisfying, and it it's, um, has the potential to sort of uh, lead us in the direction of a, a, of, of a of a humanity that is encompassing, that that um, that sort of connects the threads across time and human experience among people from from you know, all different paths. Mm -hmm. Okay, so so if I was to compare words, I mean, you know, talk, talking words versus mm -hmm. art, mm -hmm. um, just just to see if, if if I'm if I'm picking up on what you're saying. Um, so words, you know, each word kind of has a specific meaning mm -hmm. and that's kind of where it, where the inquiry kind of ends in a way of the word. I mean, mm -hmm. there's lots of other stuff, you know, like you can, like, I can be able to define a word and then know how to use it in a sentence mm -hmm. and use it in sentences and talk with it. Mm -hmm. But then that's kind of about it. Mm -hmm. um, and the word and other words have the specific purpose of being able to talk with other people and also be able to read and get around in the world, you know, mm -hmm. um, versus a work of art generally is an image, whether 2, 2D or 3D. So like a drawing or painting or a sculpture or a print. Mm -hmm. And 
So that also communicates something similarly to the way that a word communicates its meaning, whatever the word means, mm -hmm. but the image could be subject to more than one definition or more than one interpretation. Mm -hmm. And more than one person might see different things as opposed to a mm -hmm. word where everyone basically agrees on the meaning of the word. Does that seem right? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. You know, we bring our own personalities, our own psychology and our own subjective experiences with us when we view a work of art and when we consider it, when we reflect on it, um, which makes it a different experience for each person. Um, and, you know, that type of open ended uh, communication, I think, is very valuable to have in society. I, I think we, we we require this. You know, obviously, society is built upon this foundation of of direct and you know clear objective communication. But to to have another level that functions in this subjective realm, I think, is very special and um, and and necessary uh, for us as modern humans. I, I'm, I'm, I hope that that it always is so that there's always a, a realm in which we can speak to one another uh, in these in these terms uh, that unite us on on a more conceptual level. Mm -hmm. So um so if if art has this importance mm -hmm. then is that is that the same as not being utilitarian? Is it because utilitarian things arguably kind of have like one use? Like for example, you know, a pen is to write, mm -hmm. and that's it. Mm -hmm. uh, whereas art maybe has kind of more a more layered mm -hmm. and deeper kind of uh, use, I guess. I think so. I think so. I mean, when I say non-utilitarian, I don't mean non-functional. I think art mm -hmm. has has multiple functions, which are each critical. You know, it, it's, it um, creates a cultural record. It allows us to reflect on the experience of, of being alive in the society in which we live. Uh, it gives us a, a means of, again, speaking to one another um, in ways that perhaps um, bypass or 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 don't uh don't follow again the 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 realm of uh sort of you know the basic language when we communicate send an email you know talk about our day you know that's one type of thing but but when we read poetry or look at a painting that's that's a different type of of, of mental and emotional engagement mm -hmm. okay and um i'm also curious about um, what you said about how it reinforces, I think it reinforces our humanity, you said. What is, what is that humanity part? What does that mean? What does that mean? Um, well, you know, one of the, I, I feel personally that, that, you know, people are on a quest for meaning within their lives. And um, it's satisfying to understand how you as an individual perhaps fit within the broader human context. Uh, you know, we all start to relate to the world from our own eyes, like from our own individual um, understandings. And when we look at art from the past, for example, um, you know, when we look at, at uh, you know, Neolithic art and, and look at, uh, you know, the things we have left from these early societies, we wonder, you know, what they were like and who these people were. Um, when we look at, you know, Greek or Roman art or, or work from, from a different historical period than our own, you know, we are intrigued by what we see. We look for, you know, maybe um, some historical context if that's available to again broaden our experience of it um so i think that that you know we're always 
looking for meaning. We're always looking to understand our place in the world and, and in time. Mm -hmm. And um, perhaps looking at, at visual culture, at, at, at art made by early societies, even though you know our understanding of what art is wouldn't have been the same as, as theirs, and we're seeing it through our own cultural lens. Uh, but you know, certainly um, that gives an avenue for understanding uh, and contemplation that allows us to perhaps um, engage with people of the past and of the present, uh, people from vastly different life experiences than our own, and to see a common thread, common threads across all those experiences that, that we can join with uh, and, and feel a sense of connection. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay. Um, you were saying something just now, and I wanted to ask you about a thing. Mm -hmm. Um, I don't remember, but okay. Wh why would you say that they don't? Uh, you know, people of the past or whatever wouldn't don't think of art the same way as we do. Well, we we come from a certain standpoint. Again, I say that art is is non utilitarian now, perhaps because I'm a person living in the 21st century, uh, and art does not have to be utilitarian for us. In the past, it may have been much more uh, useful and necessary within uh, within daily life. It it you know had religious and spiritual uh, functions. Um, it, it would have perhaps been seen as, as more integral uh, to life experience than something set apart from it. Um, so I think that, you know, we, we look at the past through our own, our own cultural conditioning and, and, and cultural framework. And um, we can't we can't assume that what these things mean to us now is is the way that that it's always been. Um, so uh, yeah, we just uh, you know we also live in a period in time when so much is accessible to us. You know, we have so much information and imagery from from all points in time. Anything that you're well. curious. About, yeah, we have everything available. That certainly was never true <laughs> in the past. And so people would live within their own sphere uh, and function within the imagery and the symbolism that that they knew. And for us, you know, that's that's almost infinite. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's definitely true. Um, I've, I've definitely mused about it in previous episodes because the not just the access to information that each individual has, mm -hmm. but the the um, the way that information that information disseminates now mm -hmm. is, you know, the speed at which it goes now is mm -hmm. just it, it probably would have been physically impossible in the past, Absolutely. because and and you know that I think that, um, you know that makes me think a little bit about how it would return art to kind of like a more utilitarian sort of way, similar to words. Mm -hmm. Because, um, for example, if you're in the, the Renaissance in Europe, in like Italy or something, um, like the audience would be just like Italy and maybe who else is there, uh, France, Mm -hmm. um or just Italy even <laughs> or you know Greece mm -hmm. you know it's like a much smaller group of people that mm -hmm. inter I mean everyone is I mean everyone is interacting with each other with each other either way because humans have never stopped interacting with each other whether for commerce for war for sex or whatever it is that's always been happening immigration mm -hmm. but I mean I guess I'm thinking of you know like disseminating information in the form of art in that case because the visual language of that time and from before still more was so standardized that 
artistic imagery could be used to teach illiterate people about the Bible stories, for example. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think in that sense, art is, you know, like you were saying, maybe more utilitarian for the time because it has that specific purpose. You know, it's still communication, except that the, you know, if the works of art are like words, each work of art has a more specific meaning and it's not as much subject to interpretation the way visual language is now images are now where it's like oh the you know you see a thing and i see another thing and the other, the other guy sees another thing um and yeah that's pretty that's really quite an interesting element in terms of like different times you know that yes what do you think about that no i think that's true i think when you have you know a painting uh you know a caravaggio painting showing uh you know a, a scene from the bible when you have um you know, a descent from the cross, something like that, that, that uh, almost as an illustration of functions, as an yeah. illustration of a story, uh, that is a totally different context for the people, you know, who are the original intended audience of that work uh, than it is for us now. Um, and that's, again, something we have to be mindful of as modern viewers when we consider art from the past. Um, we have our own sort of way of viewing things, which um, which is is likely very different from the way that things would have functioned within their original context. Okay. Um, okay. So, Mrs. Benham, what is beauty in your opinion? Beauty is is a feeling, I think. It is a feeling that arises within you uh, when you are struck by a powerful aesthetic experience. Um, I, I feel that it's it's a human response. I, I don't think of it as something intrinsic that exists within a certain form for us to discover. I, I think of it as our reaction to that form. Um, I think it's something, beauty is something you respond to almost instantaneously. It, it's like a visceral reaction and it can be very powerful and, and, and evocative. Mm -hmm. um, but I think it's very different from sort of the rational mind that you bring when you, or that, that may come with you when you look at a work of art. Beauty doesn't require any kind of reading or decoding, I think, to to happen in, in that moment of encounter. It just requires that you be receptive to it, that you be open and available for that that experience. Um, and it's something that can compel you uh, or inspire you towards that subject. Um, it's something that can be uh very very gratifying very um emotionally gratifying you know, within within that experience okay um so so you were saying at first that things are not you know something is not beautiful by default um <laughs> But so then, does that mean that the viewer ascribes beauty to that upon which they look? I would say so. Yes, I would say okay. so. I, I think it's up to the viewer to have that experience or not, to see that or not. And, you know, certainly there are some things that, that many people agree are beautiful, you know, organic forms in nature, uh, a sunset, um, you know, a particular landscape. Uh, a, you know, a human beauty, these are all things that, that uh, you know, many people can agree on, but I don't know that they're intrinsic properties of those things. I, I think, I think um, our reaction is, is what creates that within us. So I, I, think, I think beauty happens as you react to something that moves you. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay. That actually, I haven't talked about my translation of Richet yet, but that, that plays into it just a little bit. I, um, I translated and published my translation of 
uh, Paul Richer's Female Morphology, mm -hmm. uh, which is a great book. Um, it basically describes the variety of form uh, in within the female figure. Uh, and part of why it's such an interesting book for us now uh, is that it um, it doesn't really engage with the question of beauty, uh, which is interesting. Um, Richet was sort of the, the father of modern artistic anatomy. Uh, his text on the male figure was our textbook at the New York Academy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, that was originally published in 1890. Um, he was a young man when he wrote that book. Uh, later in his career, he became uh, the director of anatomy at the Ecole de Beaux-Arts in Paris. Uh, but that hadn't happened for him yet when he wrote uh, his first artistic anatomy. And then 30 years after that, he finally completed his work on the female figure. Um, and this is something that that uh, you know I when I found this book myself I was I was just completely taken with it I was so excited to find this resource um, and I read it through and started translating it just for my own purposes mm -hmm. and immediately realized you know how how hungry I had been for this information mm -hmm. uh, my whole my whole life my whole artistic life and I saw the value of it for other people. And I, I saw also that it would still read well uh, for a modern audience. It was written in 1920, published in 1920 originally. Um, and in my opinion, I haven't seen any other reference on the female form that is as comprehensive as his. Yeah. And so I really, I, I really wanted to bring it out again and uh, bring it out to a new readership. And I'm, I'm honored and humbled that that i was uh, able to do that mm -hmm. yeah that's really cool that book is awesome yeah mm -hmm. i um the um Rocher reminds me a little bit of a teacher from the academy who i don't know if you know but his name is randy MacGyver. Mm -hmm. yeah um yeah. yeah he this this guy he's i mean he's not a doctor like dr Roche, mm -hmm. but he is like Dr. Roche in that he has so much experience drawing and painting and sculpting. And he has like the, the familiarity with the figure, mm -hmm. but not, but you know, like the wonder isn't taken out from their work in the way that I was whining about earlier with Atelier work that's formulaic. Mm -hmm. um, because it's like, you know, that sculpture on the cover of the book that you translated is just like, it's like, you can't, you can't make that mm -hmm. and not be mystified by the figure and be mm -hmm. like, oh my God, this is amazing. I can't believe I get to sculpt this. It's like, how do I make this figure so that it looks, so that like the fingers have like the delicacy of the model that I'm trying to convey. It's like, how do I, how do I make these breasts so that they are, fair so that they do justice to mm -hmm. the breasts and like the differently shaped torsos of these women that are these bodies these women that are posing for me mm -hmm. you know so it's like yeah I mean I I guess um I am further curious about the argument that things are not beautiful don't hold beauty by default because because um, you know, talking about that and getting goosebumps thinking about the figure and wanting to convey it because it's like a, a way of adoration in a way, uh, you know, um, because, you know, there are, there is for sure at least one standard of beauty that is just cross-cultural, cross-time, and that's like symmetry, for example. Um, so... And, you know, that doesn't guarantee that a person is going to be found attractive or anything, but it seems like it is a standard, a beauty standard in the sense that it at least increases the likelihood 
that this person will be found attractive by someone else or, you know, beautiful uh, because they're not the same, right? Um, and I guess I think the reason for which there there must be, or at least it makes sense to me that there would be uh, beauty by default in another person or some or some you know nature things um is because i guess i kind of feel like even if it isn't as meaningful as it feels it still has like enabled i guess our survival because uh, i'm reading a book called the art instinct and uh it's written by dennis dutton and he argues that uh, both art and beauty have kind of um, allowed our survival just through since we've been here in a way. So, mm -hmm. so you know that uh, to me that insinuates that there is something within everyone, you know, in common within everyone and w between everyone and nature mm -hmm. that kind of allows us to find those things to be just you know mystifyingly beautiful that they make you stop. And be like, you know, what is happening, or what is this, or so. Uh, what do you think about that? No, that's interesting. Um, it's, it's uh, maybe that relates on some level to our psychology. I mean, mm. our in terms of perception, um, symmetry is very satisfying because it allows us to see and sort of anticipate the order within something uh, which is gratifying again on that human level of, of needing to know and wanting to know and, and being satisfied when we do know something um, so perhaps symmetry is satisfying to us on a psychological level and therefore we find it beautiful and um, sometimes uh, you could also say that the unexpected or those, those little accidents that give a little bit of flavor to something are can also be very beautiful you know something that's just slightly askew within a pattern can be can can be compelling and, and, mm -hmm. and can also be beautiful you know a lot of organic forms have that quality you you have sort of a repetition of pattern and then something that just shifts the pattern or just, you know, gives another accent to it so that it's not all the same and immediately it's compelling and, and, and uh, you know, you want to look into that further. Um, as you, you know, one, maybe one nice expression of this is, is uh, Edward Lane Terry's idea of, of points of rest within the human body that you know you don't have this this transition from one curve into another curve you know that that doesn't tend to happen you have you have some kind of transitional form that shifts the direction uh and prepares for for the next shape to to uh, to come from there so um perhaps that also relates to our psychology and the way we process visual information that we Again, we seek order uh, because that allows us to anticipate, you know, the unknown and relate it back to our known experiences. But then we also are intrigued by finding things that that may contradict that order. Yes, yes. Yeah. You know, at the same time, um, because I'm kind of I'm kind of I'm kind of like stuck thinking about the whether something has and has beauty by default or not because mm -hmm. it has been mentioned in previous episodes you know in, in previous episodes when in several previous episodes not all of them but some of them mm -hmm. when i asked my guest what is beauty in their opinion they always made their they would make this relationship with nature mm -hmm. uh you know like you said we are sunset and just the trees and landscape like this stuff it's like that is that stuff is obviously beautiful mm -hmm. um and there was also this insinuation that if you want to experience beauty, you have to look for it, which is basically what you were saying. Um, and I also actually really like that idea because um, similarly to, um, you know, maybe like the satisfaction of struggling with a drawing, 
you know, you, you're rewarded with a drawing that you like in the end. So it's like in the case of beauty, for example, if for whatever reason, you know, like you said, you're open and you're available, you know, you're listening for, um, mm -hmm. then when it happens, you're rewarded with this uh, very gratifying experience that kind of just, I don't know, like grounds you in the moment. And it's like, oh, it's cool that I'm here or this is awesome. I'm so glad I'm alive you know yes. <laughs> something like that awesome. that happens that's just the greatest isn't it <laughs> yes <laughs> yes yeah yeah no it, it really is and and um yeah because I mean it's definitely I mean I was gonna say it's easy to forget but I I generally don't forget like about that you know like your musical instruments are there for you when you go looking for them it's like beauty is also there mm -hmm. uh available in that same way for when we go looking for it right you know or for whenever we want to experience it and you know i guess also <laughs> to further muse about this i guess it also kind of goes with when people say that beauty can be found also in in quote unquote ugly things or um i don't know just I don't know my my radiator heater I don't know something like that you know I guess what do you think about this this last bit here <laughs> does that seem right absolutely yeah I think I think um you know beauty functions on more than just an aesthetic level sometimes right. um, sometimes your appreciation of a thing influences your feeling about it um sometimes you may you may the, the, the reverse could also be true. Sometimes you may dislike something that is inherently beautiful and you have a negative reaction to it because of your own personal preferences or feelings. Um, so I think that certainly uh, the way in which we feel about something prepares us to engage with it and to, to find a beautiful experience when it's available to us. Okay. Well, um, I like that a lot as the last thoughts of the, our conversation, uh, Mrs. Benham, because we have reached the 55 minute mark of our conversation. Um, so I want to start to close it out. Why don't you um, tell our future listeners and viewers uh, where your work can be found? What are you up to lately? Is there anything you want to add? Any projects you're excited about? Some of this type of stuff? Great. Um, my Riche translation is available on Amazon. Uh, that's out there for anyone uh, interested. I'm hoping to do a few speaking engagements relative to that uh, as the year goes on. So I'll put that information on my website when I have it. Um, we are teaching classes ongoing in Montreal uh, in person. And I do have a couple other book projects, uh, but I'm not going to say too much about them until they're more complete. Yes. Uh, but hopefully next year I will have another work coming out into the world. And some of my prints and paintings are available on my Etsy site, Venom Studio. Uh, I have some dry point engravings on there as well as some landscape oil paintings. Okay. Uh, and uh, yeah, so that's, that's why I'm here. Okay, that's great. Um, I will put the pertinent links um, in the video description. So your website and your Etsy store, mm -hmm. I'll use those links. Okay, well, um, thank you very much everyone for watching and listening. Special thanks to my guest, Alana, for agreeing to talk to me and for your time, for her time. If you'd like to support Alana, my podcast, myself, or all three, all uh, corresponding links will be in the caption. And make sure you like this video and leave a comment so we know you saw this episode. Also remember to subscribe to my audiovisual channel. And uh, thank you very much, everyone. And see you next time. Bye. <laughs>